Looks like Robbie's recording, so. Awesome. Right. Sorry, just one second. I'm trying to pull up some materials before we get started. Okay, um, thank you all for coming this afternoon to the to this webinar. This is the third webinar in our post COVID, although it's increasingly feeling like it's not going to be post COVID uh, series about what the economy might look like in the coming years and how we can center justice and sustainability. And today we're going to be talking about housing justice and eco gentrification. And I'm excited to have um, two great faculty members all the way out from Hawaii joining us. I know it's or much earlier over there for them. So I appreciate them both joining us. Um, and so I will first introduce myself and then I'll introduce our other two panelists. And then uh, the way that we are planning to do this is we'll each speak for about 10 or so minutes. And then that'll leave us with about 30 minutes for some question and answering, uh, question and answer after um, our presentations. So I'll begin, I am Phil Warsaw. I am a member of the executive board uh, for the U.S. Society of Ecological Economics. I am also an assistant professor in the Department of Community Sustainability at Michigan State. Um, I have, my background is in um, traditional economics, but I um, it was increasingly disappointed with how economics treated matters of justice, which eventually brought me over to the field of ecological economics. And my research primarily centers um, housing in the, at its, in the intersection with, between affordable housing and food security. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about my work in just a moment, but we also have Phil Garboden on with us and Phil is the HCRC professor in affordable housing economics, policy and planning at the University of Hawaii. His work examines how the decisions of supply side actors, landlords, property managers and developers are shaped by domestic housing policies and how these decisions impact the lives of poor tenants. And then, Jen, I hope I do not pronounce your name and say me correctly here, but uh, Jen, uh, Jen, Jennifer Dara Okiki, am I pronouncing that correctly? Great. Um, is an associate professor of sociology at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. She had received her PhD from Brown University and was a postdoctoral research associate at John Hopkins University before joining the University of Hawaii. She has over 15 years of professional experience conducting research in communities throughout Hawaii as well as housing and neighborhood research experience in other cities, including Baltimore, Cleveland, and Dallas. She has published research on residential attainment, urban development, homelessness, and land and housing policy. At the University of Hawaii, she teaches courses in urban sociology and racism and ethnicity. She was born and raised on the island of Oahu and lived for many years in Cambridge, Massachusetts before returning to Hawaii. She currently lives in, um, I am, I'm realizing my Hawaiian pronunciations are terrible, but Wailai, New. Jenny, Jen, do you want to pronounce? Oh, that was so mean. I sent that to you. Wile Anui, you're doing great. <laughs> Sorry about that. No yeah. worries. Uh, with her family, including two children and a dog. So thank you again for, for agreeing to, to speak with us today. And I will start by just giving a, uh, temp, a short presentation, talking a little bit about the history of housing policy in the United States for those who maybe need a refresher on the ideas of redlining and blockbusting and how they might contribute to some of the inequalities that we're seeing today. And then Phil is going to talk a bit about um, community development and how that might look in terms of uh, gentrification. And then Jen is going to talk about some of the work she's been doing, trying to address affordable housing um, in Hawaii. And so if I can just, I'm going to pull up my slides here. And then once I navigate this Zoom tile that always pops up at the top of my screen, I will get going. And so when we when we were thinking about putting together this webinar series on the post COVID economy, one of the topics that came um, that was first that was foremost in my mind was the issue of housing. And this is something that we don't that I've personally felt that is, is, is understudied within the field of ecological economics, um, but is, is really important for us to consider when we think about matters of environmental justice, because when we think about the ways in which environmental justice have traditionally been studied or measured, whether it's in economics or in um, the other social sciences, 
we're often talking about your exposure to either risks or your access to certain amenities, whether we're talking about exposure to air pollution or access to green space, often within the context of your own home, right? So how close do you live to any of these amenities or are, to what extent is your household exposed to some of these hazards? And so thinking about the issues around affordable housing and what policy recommend or what approaches we might take to make affordable housing more uh, readily available to, to people is really, at, to me, at the core of the environmental justice project. And so I'm sure much of this will be um, uh, familiar to many of you who have studied or thought about the issues of, issues of housing in the United States. But just um, as a quick refresher, you know, when we think about the history of housing in the United States, there are really two, there are two um, sort of policies or time periods that I think are, are most commonly discussed and are increasingly research or um, increasingly being studied today. The first is redlining. And so just as a quick reminder, uh, in the 1930s, as part of the New Deal, um, there was a policy put into place by FDR to try to get more people into homes, basically, right? So we're trying to stimulate the economy by making um, afford by making loans more readily available to households. And so, as part of that process, uh, they ordered the homeowners loan corporation to create maps of 239 of the major metro areas in the United States to designate areas within those cities based on their uh, the quality of their housing as well as their riskiness in terms of investing in in homes in those areas, because again, these were loans that were going to be backed by the federal government. And these neighborhoods were graded on a scale from A to D, with A representing the best neighborhoods or the neighborhoods that were considered the lowest risk for, for backing financially, and with D being the lowest grade um, or hazardous, again, representing areas that were considered the riskiest places to invest um, federal dollars or for the uh, back for these federally backed mortgages. And somewhat unsurprisingly, given the time, these uh, grades were used to codify race patterns of racial segregation in order to ensure that only certain populations had access to credit. And so what ended up happening is areas that were predominantly made up of BIPOC, specifically African-American households, were given lower grades systematically across the country, which then meant that, that families in these neighborhoods were unable to get access to federally backed loans, which made purchasing a home much more difficult. And what ended up happening is that these maps not only uh, were representative of segregation at that time, but they became self-fulfilling prop, uh, prophecies because if you can't afford or if you can't get you know, this federally backed mortgage to be able to buy a home in these neighborhoods that are graded as C or a D, you're less likely to want to move there. So families who had the means to do so would choose to live in an area where they could more readily get the financing necessary to buy a home which typically tended to be upper and middle class white families who then would leave these areas that were already fairly segregated, which then not only led to a loss of wealth and investment in these neighborhoods, but also sort of codified and solidified them as neighborhoods that were gonna be made up of people of color. Now, um, as part of this to sort of ensure, not on top of right line to ensure that these neighborhoods would remain either again, the segregated neighborhoods would remain either all black or all white. Um, neighborhoods that were not considered to be hazardous, so these neighborhoods that were given these higher scores, um, also implemented or developed these racial covenants, which explicitly restricted home buying on based on your racial, uh, based on your based on your race. So basically, even if you could, for instance, had the means to move out of a neighborhood that had been given a poor grade from the homeowners loan corporation, you might find that the neighborhood that you want to move to, which may be a white majority neighborhood, may not be a neighborhood you're able to move to because of these racial covenants, which may restrict whether or not you're able to buy a home in them. Now, in theory, this was supposed to end in 1968 with the Fair Housing Act, which ended both redlining and racial covenants. However, in practice, this wasn't necessarily the case because what ended up happening is that in many of the neighborhoods that had previously had these racial covenants or were previously redlined, um, in order to ensure that, or in order to, um, um, sorry, that's not what I'm trying to say. What, what ended up happening is that in these neighborhoods that had previously been given a, uh, an advantageous grade from, the, from Hulk, 
um, where now they can no longer segregate against people of color who maybe wanted to move into those neighborhoods. Instead, what ended up happening is this more informal process known as blockbusting. And so within blockbusting, and you can see an article on the right here, which sort of talks about, which illustrates what this process looks like. What would happen is real estate agents would go into neighborhoods that previous that were now forced to integrate and would say, if you if you aren't careful, people of color are going to start moving in, your value of your home is gonna is gonna fall, and then you're gonna end up losing basically everything that you've invested in your home because your neighborhood is going to become racially diverse. And so this was used as a tactic to entice people or to entice primarily white families, again, particularly middle and upper class white families who were maybe worried about the about incoming families of color ruining their home, the value of their homes to sell their homes at a cheaper price. And what this did then is it basically led to a second round of this pattern of white flight where families who had the means to leave would basically move out of neighborhoods that were, again, uh, either previously majority white or um, uh, or were at, at risk of integrating. And then with them would go all of the financial resources that um, that go with home ownership. And so what this means in terms of um, what we see currently with disparate patterns of exposure to risk is that in many of these communities where you have um, either that were previously redlined or experienced blockbusting, these are the neighborhoods where you're seeing people of color who were disproportionately exposed to air pollution. Because what happens is in these neighborhoods where you've had either redlining or blockbusting, home values fall because again, um, people who have the means to leave do so, which means there simply isn't enough demand from high income families to support higher home values. And as home values fall, so too effectively does the political voice of those communities. And so you see this um, often, or most prevalently with school districting, where school districts that are in areas that have lower property values don't have access to the resources, resources to support their public schools. But then in addition, there's been research which indicates that these neighborhoods also don't have the political power to resist, for instance, when a new um, uh, power plant wants to move in or a new um, energy or energy project wants to come in, which may then lead to lower air quality. And these areas are chosen specifically because um, they have less political will as represented by their reduced home values. Now, um, in my work, in the way that I have studied this, I'm primarily interested in thinking about urban retail in particular, and specifically access to, to food and how that has been affected by both redlining and blockbusting. And so going back to what I was just saying a minute ago about blockbusting and how that um, affected the, um, the income base in many, of, in many of the communities that experienced blockbusting, one of the ways that we can see this impact is through the decisions made by large urban retailers. So in areas that were blockbusted, we saw urban retail hit a low point in the 1980s. And the reason for this is fairly straightforward. In neighborhoods that were previously either majority white or again, um, maybe were integrated but had a significant white population that were now for forced to integrate, and then you had white families leave because again, they were concerned about what would happen to their home values. What that left were a lot of families who basically didn't have the means to go anywhere. So this is lower income households, both white and black. And so if I'm a business and I'm thinking about where I wanna locate, I'm less likely to stick around in the neighborhoods where all the money's left. Instead, I'm gonna follow the, the families who are taking all their money with them to the suburbs. And so in the context of food access, a phenomenon that has often been discussed is that of supermarket redlining, which describes when supermarkets are disinclined to live or to locate in inner cities or low income neighborhoods and instead move their stores into the suburbs. And this is almost always a direct result of reduced income levels and property values as a result, again, of this demographic transition. transition. And so you can see here one example of this um, in Atlanta and how how this is represented. If you look at these areas that are highlighted in red, these are areas that were previously graded a D um, um, with the, red, with the uh, Hulk scores. And in these areas that have lower Hulk scores, they are, they are primarily convenience stores, 
very few supermarkets, whereas when you start to get out into the suburbs, areas that had that received higher whole grades, you have a higher density of supermarkets. Now, in my context, my work primarily look, or my, my work has been centered in Milwaukee for the last five years. Um, and I, I'm interested in Milwaukee, I've been interested in Milwaukee for a number of reasons. One, um, it's one of the most segregated cities in America still. And this is a pattern that you see across a lot of Midwestern Rust Belt cities where you have these heavy, where you see this extreme segregation, which follows in many ways this pattern of redlining. So the previous slide, you see the redlining map for Milwaukee. And then you can see where even now um, the current demographics of the city are very much in line uh, with that redlining, uh, redlining map. And so if you look at um, the way that I've thought about this is from an affordable housing context, within the context of affordable housing is, um, how expensive is it or what does it cost to live in a neighborhood that has access to a grocery store, right? Or if you're living in a neighborhood and you wanna buy a home within that neighborhood that's near a grocery store, how much is that gonna cost you? And how much does that vary based on the demographic composition of your, of your neighborhood? And, and what I found is that if you live in a neighborhood that has a high percentage of Black and Latinx households, you're basically paying more, all things held equal, to live next to a grocery store. So if you're living in a neighborhood that has very few um, people of color, so Milwaukee is a city that is almost 100% Black, White, or Latinx. So when the population of Black and Latinx falls in the neighborhood, that basically means that population is going to be majority or all white. And so in neighbors in Milwaukee where the white population is very high, it doesn't cost that much to live next to a grocery store. Whereas if you're living in a neighborhood that uh, is majority Black or majority Latinx, you're paying multiple extra, multiple thousands of dollars extra on your home um, just to be able to live next to a single grocery store. And this is, this is um, not just connected to um, uh, current demographics, but you can see it, there's a legacy here that ties back to, to, this idea, to this trend of blockbusting. So what I'm showing you here is a map of just how much in terms of actual dollars people were paying in 2011 to live next to a grocery store. And then also how that varies based on not just current demographics, but going back and looking at uh, blockbusting in, in those neighborhoods. So what you see in this table here is between 1950 and 1990, uh, basically what was the, to what extent did the white population in neighborhoods, neighborhoods being defined here by census tracts, uh, leave throughout the city over this 40 year period? And what you can see is in neighborhoods that had less than 25% of the white population leave, home prices only go up about 1% um, if you're living within a half mile of a grocery store. Uh, but for in neighborhoods where you have over 75% of the white population leaving, that more than doubles. Um, and so what we're seeing here is not just that um, it's more costly to live in, in a neighborhood that has access to, to food if you're living, uh, if, you're, if you're in a neighborhood that's primarily people, of, that has a majority of people of color, but that this is not just a reflection of what's going on now, but is a reflection of a process that started, you know, 60, 70 years ago. And so what we're, and what we're currently working on with this, with this uh, research is we're trying to assess the extent to which this is a reflection of not just these historical demographics, but sort of from an economics perspective, how this reflects these localized dynamics of supply and demand and ongoing constraints about how people think about neighborhoods that are accessible to them. And so that was a lot of gobbledygook, but to give you the, the, the more straightforward intuition, if I'm a household, if I'm a, if I'm a black household and I'm thinking about moving to Milwaukee and I see how segregated the city remains, I'm unlikely to think about all neighborhoods as being equal, right? I'm less likely to move to a neighborhood that's majority white, given the history of segregation within the city and ongoing policies which make, um, which continue to sort of reinforce this informal segregation. For instance, um, the previous governor of Wisconsin, Scott Walker, nixed several public transportation projects which would have linked the city of Milwaukee to the suburbs more easily, obviously making those areas more accessible for families of color who maybe wanted to move out of the city and into the suburbs. 
And so when you see that, you might not see the entire city as being all the same in terms of where I could go to live. And so if I'm limited to a small number of, of neighborhoods, and if those neighborhoods have fewer grocery stores, there's of course gonna be greater competition to live in homes that are next to crucial amenities like food and other things. And so that's what we're thinking is what's driving home prices in these areas. But again, it, it's sort of this balance between a lack of access to food today, well, you know, which is a result of this, these policies that started uh, 60 or 70 years ago, and how do you address them? And I know I, I, I'm, I've gone over time here a bit, but just to very quickly wrap up and to pass it over to Phil Garboden, I will say that the city of Milwaukee has tried to address this problem by improving the number of grocery stores that are available in many neighborhoods throughout the city. But the challenge here, and this sort of ties into what I think Phil is going to talk about next, the problem is that when you start to do that, um, on the one hand, you're making you're making food more available to people, but you're also starting to drive up home prices. And this article was from 2017. And in 2021, the story now is that neighborhoods or residents in neighborhoods that are seeing these improvements are worried that gentrification is changing their neighborhoods for the worse. And one thing that we are seeing, uh, that I'm seeing in my work, and I'll, I'll end with this, is that if you look at housing prices by whole grades, what we're seeing is that in neighborhoods that were previously graded D, so these areas that are really close to downtown, we're starting to see home prices creep up and up and actually start to catch up with home prices in some of the areas that had previously been graded much higher um, via the, uh, had received, previously received much higher whole grades. And so all of these things are sort of combined to give, tell us a story of historical policies, which maybe lead to some of the inequalities we see now, but then efforts to address those inequalities may actually be making homes less affordable for folks who are living uh, in these neighborhoods that have been previously divested from. And so with that, I will pass over to Phil Garboden, who I think is going to talk, pick up the story of talking about community development and revitalization and what that means from a, the perspective of gentrification. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Um, let me share my screen here. Um, I, there's a pretty ideal segue, I think, between the two uh, presentations um, and between the two Phil's, as it were. So. Uh, thank you very much for having me today, of course. Uh, I think the topic of uh, green gentrification fits into a larger conversation on how we do revitalization, right? So, you know, just heard uh, the classic conundrum around food deserts and you bring grocery stores in um, and, and the double-edged sort of that. Um, and a green amenities are sort of one of many types of things that we need to bring into, um, into communities. Um, and the fundamental question is always how we do that in a way that actually benefits the people who are currently living there, not some imagined future community full of new people. Um, so the talk today I'm going to give is based on a paper that I have with Christine Jang Tretian. So I want to make sure I give her due co-author credit. Um, there. Okay, so I wanted to start with with the basically three inconvenient facts of community revitalization. Um, and I've tweaked these a bit to be about green investments, but the same logic really applies for anything from bike lanes to blight remediation, vacant housing demolition, um, re rehabilitation funds, and so forth. Um, and I'm not obviously going to resolve all these issues. Um, this my short my short answer uh, solution is, is housing subsidies and, and and development of housing in in neighborhoods that are undergoing revitalization. But that's that's not really the focus of my uh, my talk today. Uh, the three inconvenient truths are one: anything that improves well-being in a community, such as grocery stores, uh, increases uh, will increase the cost of non-subsidized housing in that community. Right? Any, anything that makes a community more desirable um, for you know, even if it's designed to make it more desirable for the legacy residents, uh, is going to make that community more desirable, uh, generally increase demand and that far rise, increase housing prices. Uh, the second is that green infrastructure, urban farming, and so forth, uh, certainly represent amenities, but the benefits are not conferred evenly to residents, right? Like any other amenity, some, some residents are going to be enthusiastic about them and others are not. Um, and insofar as these types of investments may confer benefits to higher income folks uh, 
or at least may present something that higher income folks are more desirable of, uh, they have the potential to accelerate residential turnover, although of course that varies based on the type of investment. Um, and finally, just to say the obvious is depriving poor and BIPOC communities of green infrastructure and so forth as a way of avoiding housing cost increases is, is not the solution to this. And it indeed, of course, exacerbates inequality. This, the solution to, um, to the, the contradictions of gentrification are, are not to avoid making low income communities nicer, right, for the folks who live there, um, as tempting as that sometimes is, give, given, given the, uh, the challenges uh, associated with, with investment. And I not only have a few minutes for my talk here, but I wanted to pull an illustrative case uh, from field work with a team of folks uh, at Johns Hopkins uh, that we've been doing in, in Baltimore City. In a nutshell, we follow communities in central and east Baltimore on the map there uh, for over the last five years, or really the five years prior to the COVID epidemic. Um, and all of these neighborhoods were going through some form of revitalization, gentrification, neighborhood change. And the cases in our sample ranged from massive demolition and redevelopment, your sort of traditional urban renewal style neighborhood revitalization, if you want to even call, use that revitalization word, uh, to areas of more traditional sort of artist gentrification, you know, or demand pressures in certain areas, um, to communities with endogenous nonprofit investments, community development corporations, exogenous nonprofit <laughs> investments, all manner of things designed to make the communities in these two rectangles, um, which except for the top half of, of number two there have been traditionally uh, fairly divested in, in Baltimore City, um, make them more, more livable, uh, you know, quote, unquote, quote, unquote, revitalize them. And I obviously don't have time to get into sort of the comparative cases here with the different forms of revitalization. Um, but I want to give you a sense of our method. We investigated change in a number of ways, including in-depth interviews with over 400 residents, developers, and landlords within our two catchment areas, um, systematic, uh, structured systematic observation of the neighborhoods. So every two years, returning to the neighborhoods, doing a block face level analysis of um, abandoned properties, other forms of, of litter, trash, other you know, observable aspects of the community. Um, as well as demographic survey and traditional ethnographic work of attending community association meetings and so forth. Um, and it's this, that last piece that I'll be focusing on for the day today. And so I wanted to zero in specifically on one neighbor in Baltimore. If anyone is familiar with Baltimore, you, you may or may not know this name, um, which is the community of Oliver in East Baltimore. Um, and like much of the area for our full study and the city of Baltimore as a whole, Oliver experienced severe population decline post-World War II. As jobs and people left the city, uh, the legacies of redlining and predatory inclusion left black neighborhoods like Oliver with hundreds if not thousands of abandoned properties. Near zero, even negative real estate value um, and all the associated crime and disorder that such divestment uh, brings to a neighborhood. So you can see on the chart here, uh, we don't have data for Baltimore going back as far as we have data for Baltimore. Oh, sorry, we don't have data for Oliver going back as far as we have data for um, Baltimore, but you can see this is a very traditional Rust Belt pattern. I'm, I'm sure folks in, in Michigan are familiar with, um, you know, pretty intense rapid growth up until the 1940s, 50s and 60s, followed by a period of, of sharp decline um, leading to, le leading to, to abandonment and um, a, a fractured economic base. All right, but recently uh, a mass urban renewal project in Middle East here in the center of, our, of the map on the screen, which consists of the, the demolition of hundreds of vacant um, and occupied homes to support Johns Hopkins development of a biotech park uh, in the area, um, has suddenly brought supply side attention back to the neighborhoods adjacent to this intervention, right? So we're not, uh, in this talk, we're not studying the, the major intervention in the Middle East um, directly, uh, we're studying, you know, what you might call the spillover effects of what's happening to the neighborhoods that are surrounding it, um, which the Middle East development was interpreted by developers, landlords, investors in Baltimore as potentially spurring uh, gentrification, revitalization in the surrounding communities, le leading to, to significant investment. And, and Oliver on this map is in the upper left hand corner there. And you can tell by the presence of blue, both light and dark blue rectangles, uh, that there have been unprecedented levels of reinvestment in Oliver um, uh, over the last five, 10 
years, based based primarily building primarily off uh, the, the 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 major projects in the Middle East. Although there have are nonprofit organizations in in Oliver uh, that are working to ensure affordable housing revitalization and development too. That um, should should also get some of the some of the credit. Um, for this as well. So um, then you could you can see from this map that the revitalization portions of Oliver tend to be located in the areas to the south and east of, of the neighborhood, places more adjacent to the ever-growing uh, Johns Hopkins Medical School campus there in East Baltimore. And you can see that over the entire area here in East Baltimore that this revitalization has been and even the, the neighborhood of Broadway East, just to the east of Oliver and to the north of Middle East, um, has um, some enormous levels of blight um, near total abandonment, you know, blocks with only one or two non-abandoned houses in the uh, northeast corner there, um, and has so far resisted any meaningful levels of, of change. Um, I should also say by way of context that even though these renovated units represent a demographic shift in Oliver, uh, our data suggests that they do not represent a racial shift in Oliver, that we're looking primarily at low income African American families being replaced by higher income African American homeowners and so forth. In this particular case, other, other neighborhoods in our sample sites show the traditional uh, racial uh, turnover that accompanies gentrification in, in most contexts. All right. Um, so private developers in in Oliver, unlike those uh, in the in the large scale demolition in, in, in Middle East, um, are comparatively modest, right? We're not Baltimore at this point, or at least Oliver at this point, was not attracting national money, right? The folks who are investing in these revitalization were at times very small investors, renovating one or two properties at a time, two larger, larger but local uh you know, investors doing doing dozens of dozens of homes and whole block renovations. Um, but nonetheless, we're, we're looking at local money uh, and, and smaller money. And what that means is that they understood that they had to work with the existing community to some degree to realize their vision of a new Oliver and a new, therefore, profitable Oliver for their revitalization efforts. Um, so they worked hard to form coalitions between legacy homeowners and new residents. Um, one of their primary mechanisms for that is a community organizer that they hired uh, to support their work. And in this presentation, I'm going to use the pseudonym for him as, as James. Um, as the quote shows, James is focused uh, essentially on rebranding the community away from one that has a reputation for drugs and crime and into a new urban living experience. So James says, the neighbors see that the neighborhood, Oliver, it's growing. They see things that don't typically occur on an East Baltimore street, which is white and black people sitting together, drinking beer, having fun, and it shows growth. We, we do this every Friday. We had a black party last Friday, last Saturday for July 4th, which was nice. Baltimore's used to black parties. It's what happens. You cook out, you play loud music. What they're not used to is having it be an intimate setting where really people really get to know each other, right? So you can see how James and throughout our field work from James that we uh, talk about at length in the paper, um, he's a, a master at sort of understanding the sort of normal patterns and habits of the legacy community and then transitioning them just enough so that um, they can be part of a, a rebrand for the neighborhood supporting the, the developer partners who are revitalizing the mostly row homes in the neighborhood. All right, so what does this have to do with ecology and green gentrification? Well, one of the ways in which James hopes to rebrand the community is via urban gardening. And I just wanted to read an excerpt from field notes uh, taken at one of the community meetings that James organized. So the field notes say about 14 residents, uh, almost all homeowners, uh, both legacy and new, uh, are sitting outside of the street on a warm night in July. Um, after some discussion, James notes that he has received some funding to start a community farm in Oliver. He has a vision, heirloom tomatoes. He wants Oliver to be famous for its heirloom tomatoes across the city. The other attendees are largely supportive of the farm, but are not sure about the tomato plant. A middle-aged African-American woman wants to grow onions instead. James protests something about soil quality and the difficulties of growing onions. The woman insists that she wants to grow little onions and reminds the attendees of the onions she grew in her home the previous year. Another attendee wants to know whether the residents can get the plots of their own, and James says they can. At about this time, a cloud of marijuana smoke wafts through the crowd and several attendees make jokes about how this gives them an idea for how they could make the farm truly profitable. James yells around the corner, presumably at some teenagers, we can smell your weed over here, everyone laughs, 
because the farm is still just in the planning stages, the conversation moves on along to other items. And this was, of course, a, not a major conflict. It's not the kind of thing that uh, gets written up in the papers about co communities within conflict, but I think it illustrates a subtle difference in what residents and developers believe the utility of urban farming to be. For both new and legacy residents alike, the goals of farming were inward facing. The farm was about growing food and joint gardening. For James, the farm was, for, was first and foremost about Oliver's reputation and revitalization and its image across the city as apparently a hub for heirloom tomatoes. Uh, this goal was outward facing. James at these meetings repeatedly lists recent sales price of renovated properties, reminding new and legacy homeowners that the efforts of developers are increasing equity throughout Oliver. And to me, the heart of this comes from the abdication of public responsibility for driving these types of infrastructure investments. If we want our infrastructure to reflect the needs of the community, such as growing onions, the decision makers need to be accountable to the current community, not the future more profitable community. While a minor conflict about onions and tomatoes emerged in this instance, the large issue was that no legacy renters, for example, were ever attended any of James's events. And indeed legacy homeowners, even low income ones, largely agreed with the developers that a future Oliver without poor renters was a desirable outcome. And thus this fits into a large issue around local organizing and capacity and the ease with which such processes generally thought to be the salvation of communities against outside threats are so frequently manipulated by a subset of the community in distinctly undemocratic ways. And so the conclusion here, I, as before I pass it along to Jen, is that when we think about green infrastructure investments, we certainly have to deal with the amenity thing. And we have to deal with the amenity, no matter how homegrown, no matter how community led those investments are. But to ensure that green investments in a community at least benefit the legacy community, the decision-making about what investments get based and where cannot be conducted through private grant making from James, collaborating with profit-oriented developers. It has to come from the legitimate democratic institutions of a community like Oliver, city council, neighborhood boards, and so forth, many of which um, have largely, a large, or largely invisible uh, throughout our field work in a community like that. So I'll leave it like that. I'm looking forward to answering more questions about, uh, about these issues uh, in the Q&A. Let me stop my, my stare and pass it along to Jen. Thank you. It's a good thing you mentioned my dog in the intro because she's determined to participate. So apologies for the barking in advance. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my slide. Let's make sure that it looks all right. Okay, everyone seeing that okay? Yeah, okay, great. Oh, wait a minute. I don't want that to display a setting. Okay, great. Um, well, thank you so much to Phil and Leah Bremer for inviting me. Um, and it's, uh, it's great to be in conversation here um, about housing justice in a post COVID world. And I'll be talking about an ongoing community based initiative in a part of Hawaii um, on the islands of Oahu, which is, um, is trying really hard to um, affirmatively address equity concerns and justice concerns that have arisen in the realm of housing um, and have been exacerbated because of COVID. Um, so we'll be talking about a program called the Windward Eviction Prevention Program. Um, it's also a rehousing program. And um, this, this was an initiative launched um, under the leadership of a local foundation in partnership with community organizations um, in an area that I'll, I'll say a little bit more about in a moment. That's a primarily rural area of the island of Oahu, um, where Phil, Phil Garboden and I are located. Um, and this is an area um, with a relatively large share of Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities who are facing acute risks of displacement, um, who've been facing such risks are arguably for decades. Um, and these risks are exacerbated. So I'm, I'm happy to talk about this um, context, which, which um, 
you know, allows us to think about concerns related to housing justice in a different context with different structures of race and racism and in a setting um, of settler colonialism. Um, I'll just say that this um, is work ongoing and it's collaborative work with Phil Garboden here, as well as our research team made up of Aloha Espinosa, Rachel Engel, um, and Natalie Rita. Right. Let's see, and just to orient you all, um, this is a, um, a picture of, of the regions where the work is centered, um, Windward Oahu, made up of um, some break it down into two subregions, Ko'olau Loa and Ko'olau Popa. I'm sorry, Ko'olau Popo. Um, and um, this, these are some, this is some 2020, yay, 2020 census data, um, showing uh, racial composition, shares of Native Hawaiian and, and Pacific Islanders um, alone. Of course, actually these numbers would be higher if we looked at the race um, identity and combination. So the, the point here is to show that, um, especially in Ko'olau Loa, there are larger shares of Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander populations um, as compared to the rest of the island of Oahu and then the rest, the rest of the um, state of Hawaii, where the median is about 10%. Um, if you look at the race alone data, um, where here you see um, several tracts in which the majority of residents are Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander alone. Um, these areas also have relatively large share of immigrants, um, including those from other Pacific Island Islander nations, other parts of Oceania and Asia. Let's see here. So here are some, some images of, of the work that's been going on um, since, let's see, it was launched um, last April and, and um, has been really um, going on in earnest since then. So I'll just say a little bit about what the program is um, and I'll, I'll share with you some of our provisional lessons learned. Um, so here what you're seeing um, are images of community action teams. And these action teams um, have been um, really at the heart of this work. The idea was to make them central nodes in networks, networks that would connect communities, um, vulnerable communities in need, especially um, you know, economically disadvantaged communities with resources to help keep them in their housing, to help support them in maintaining roots in their communities. Um, so what, what does that look like for community action teams from different grassroots organizations throughout the region, the Windward region that I showed you? Um, and the idea is that these community workers would um, make connections, would affirmatively reach out to find vulnerable folks um, and help them apply for rental aid. Um, it will help them access um, different forms of um, rehousing supports and other supports, including mediation services, legal aid services, um, and other kinds of access to, to needed social supports. So here you see some images of um, these uh, community action teams and some of the partners. Um, I am going to give credit to Castle Foundation here for this slide. Um, so Castle Foundation, the Harold Castle Foundation, um, it was a convener of this Windward Eviction Program. And, um, and this is another depiction of, of the vision that they helped create with input from other community leaders and stakeholders and scholars. Um, and what you see again here is that at the center, the idea is that you would have community action teams, um, also known as navigators, to be these really um, kind of anchor nodes in these networks to then help connect folks to um, government funding in particular. All right, so I'm sure many people here are very familiar with the challenges um, in which programs like this and others have been launched. Um, we, all, we know how COVID um, has generated an unprecedented need, which has been met by unprecedented levels of federal funding, um, billions in federal aid, and um, many local partners and state and local government agencies have really had to scale up from scratch to figure out a way to um, allocate these programs. And meanwhile, we know that COVID has co compounded pre-existing inequalities in housing and neighborhoods of the, of the sort that both Phil's, Phil's squared, um, we're talking about, right? And these 
are inequalities by race, ethnicity, gender, language, immigration status, disability. Um, and so we're, you know, many, many folks working in this area have noted that, you know, it's really important to affirmatively work to um, include people and places at risk of getting further left behind. Um, and then finally, the well-established social science research shows that housing instability, um, forced relocation through eviction or other forms of displacement, gentrification, if you will, um, lead to uh, um, increased risks of ending up in poor households, um, poor quality units. Um, the research has documented a range of negative ripple effects, even from you know, physical and mental health, um, et cetera. And, and these consequences can be especially um, acute for children. So it's in these contexts that um, these global challenges that many, many areas are facing that the Wimward Eviction and Rehousing Initiative was designed. Um, and I wanna say here a few words about some of their very specific local stakes. And I hope that you'll hear um, some of the threads here related to concerns about place, concerns about um, relationships, social relationships with the specific ecologies of these areas of Ko'olaua and Ko'olau Koko. Um, so for example, and these are some quotes from respondents who participated in the program. Sue, and by the way, these are pseudonyms. Um, Sue uh, is a middle-aged self-employed mom who participated in the program and she described her area as a quote unquote, true community where everyone is so willing to help each other, where families have been here for generations. Um, now, Sue's family has been very active in taking care of um, really important cultural sites within this region. Um, there, she's been a part of a longstanding effort to care for um, uh, Ivi Kupuna or um, Native, um, Native um, resting grounds that are, that are in her area. And so you can really feel um, the implications for, you know, if Sue's family is forced to leave because they can no longer afford to live there um, and because of all of the fallout from COVID, you know, there are many kinds of implications um, for her family's relationship to this place and for the caretaking um, of, of some of the cultural legacies of this place. Um, Ava is a different respondent who participated in the Windward um, program. And she's a middle-aged mom of two. Um, she enjoys living on her family's property where she lives uh, next door to her extended family. And she grows food and she's really proud of practicing what she calls a quote unquote sustainable lifestyle. Um, Tina is an elderly Asian American woman with whom we also spoke. Um, she loves where she lives. She thinks it's beautiful. There's a huge area, you know, talk about the amenities that, that Phil Garboden was talking about, right? She, she really takes advantage. It, it means so much for her to have space um, for her dogs to enjoy. And she's really worried that if she has to look for somewhere else to live, she, her, her feeling is that landlords don't like to rent to single older women and they don't like people with pets. Um, and then finally, Sarah is another middle-aged mom um, with whom we spoke. And she's a woman with Polynesian ancestry. And she told us that moving outside of that Ko'olau region or that Windward region or coming to town would mean leaving the place where she and her children were born and raised. Um, sorry, where, where her children were born. Um, actually, she was born there too, although her parents were, immigrated, were immigrants. Um, and she would lose support that comes from family members who live right down the street. So these are just four stories among hundreds um, that we're sure the community navigators who are the center of this program could share. Um, but these, I pulled these out because I think these, these views, they really illustrate the stakes, um, the stakes for housing justice in this kind of context and um, the importance of trying to promote stability and secure community for this region like others. Okay. Um, so as I mentioned, our team is involved in an ongoing learning partnership um, convened by the Castle Foundation and collaborating with the community navigators. And um, so our task has been to participate as best as possible, understand the program rollout, and that's meant attending lots of meetings. Um, fortunately, some have been in person, others have been over Zoom, um, and we've been doing ongoing accompaniments with the community navigators as they've done their work. And we've coupled this with some in-depth 
uh, narrative interviews with families. So some of the quotes that I provided before were from these in-depth interviews. Um, future steps will include modeling of administrative and other demographic data. And to protect privacy, we've used pseudonyms and the pictures shown here of the um, program organizers, but not of the beneficiaries. So we'll just see a few of our lessons um, learned and you can see that our time is running a little short. So I think, you know, now that I've given an overview of the program, I'll fly through this, but um, I'm open to questions. Um, but overall, um, the community navigators have um, supported over 500 clients from this region, so 500 households, um, so more individuals, um, primarily by helping them apply to uh, apply for um, city and state funded rental relief. And I just want to underscore the importance of this, given the national conversation, which has shown that many of our most vulnerable renters nationwide um, are facing many barriers to application for rental relief. And so um, this is this program has really been designed to um, you know, leverage um, really community-rooted relationships of trust and familiarity to help folks who might otherwise um, not have applied for, for government funding. So you can see here um, some images of the kind of outreach that's gone on. Um, and the teams, the, the action teams have used a really wide range of approaches, including um, connecting with folks at other events like food drives, vaccine clinics, gatherings you see here. Um, they have gone door to door. Uh, they passed out flyers. Um, importantly, the navigators um, draw upon a wide range of both personal and professional networks that they've tapped into. And we've, we've heard from interviews repeatedly how um, you know, folks were felt some folks felt comfortable calling back navigators, interacting them because they were known, they were trusted. You know, these are small rural communities, and so um, um, and the, many of the community navigators have longtime roots in those communities. So we hear things like, "Okay, well, my cousin, you know, knew the navigator, so you know, I felt I knew it was a good call." Um, and the partners have offered special support for families in multi generational homes, self employed individuals. Um, for whom when applying for federal aid proving impact um, can be and has been trickier than folks formally implied. This makes sense given you know, Hawaii's tourism economy and many folks in these regions are working in, in services like house cleaning. Um, and they've, they've provided special support for elders, those facing illness or distress. Um, and, 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 and really what we've learned is the different ways that community navigators have quite literally handheld respondents through the processes of applying for funding and then hopefully shoring up um, their, their presence and their, their ability to remain in these communities, um, which they've loved. So here's some more images of the kind of outreach. Um, we, um, you know, we identified for now um, two major kinds of barriers that the navigators have helped respondents overcome. So first, were the technical barriers. Um, and, you know, here's where justice really like the devil's in the details, right? Um, you know, you've got funding, you've got opportunities, and yet, especially for folks going through hardship, um, some of these technical barriers can just be incredible. Um, they can, you know, like for, you know, they might, oh, wait, what's the big deal? You know, but um, for example, we heard from Tina, um, who is the elder Asian American woman I introduced earlier. And, and for her, it was really challenging to, to figure, she didn't have printing at home. She had to figure out how to go to a store and print and sign. There were all kinds of sensitive documents and um, requirements. Um, and um, Anna, similarly, is another elder with whom we spoke. She and her partner, they don't have a computer. Um, they both lost jobs due to the pandemic. Um, they even lost a, a family member. Tragically, they fell behind in rent for three months. Um, and unlike Tina, um, when we met with them, they explained that they had not heard about the program until a local elder group, um, a friend from that group who was friends with one of the community navigators let her know about this program. And so she was contacted directly. And here's a case where, you know, um, it just seems really hard to imagine how she would have applied to this program without the community navigator. The navigator um, traveled to her house many times, brought the printouts, um, really worked with her directly. And this navigator, um, Anna described this navigator as a blessing. Um, 
let's see. I, I see that time is running short, so I'll probably pause after um, talking about this second kind of barrier, which you know we think is, is pretty important. Um, that that navigators um, overcame helped overcome barriers to applying for assistance related to distress and worry. So there are really a host of, if you might want to call them emotional or psychological kinds of barriers that we think it can be easy to underestimate um, from a policy point of view. And so, you know, for us, this, the story of Angelina was really, really powerful. Um, well, and others. Um, she's a 54 year old Polynesian woman and she talked to us about feeling just lost and not happy after she was laid off of her position in the tourism industry. Um, she, you know, tried really hard to make up um, the shortfall. She, you know, spent her savings. She used her life insurance, um, and she did apply for her own before she met up with our navigators. Um, but then, in 2021, the assistance she had got previously was just still not enough. She was still behind, um, and you know, it, it's these little moments that are so telling. So she talked to us about, you know, once she worked with a navigator. She called the application process, quote, um, easy and less stressful. And, you know, at one point, um, she was so overwhelmed that she talked about needing to deliver documents to this community navigator. Um, and she drove up to the community center and she had her documents in the car. And she just, she just couldn't even bring herself to get out of the car to deliver these documents. And the community navigator, you know, she called her in the cell phone. She said, you know what, don't worry, I'll come out and get it. Um, you know, you stay, don't worry, I got you. And it was this kind of story that we heard repeatedly that really shows how these community navigators um, can help overcome numerous barriers that vulnerable community members face as they try to, you know, maintain their homes and maintain their presence in these vulnerable communities. Um, so I'll go ahead and stop there. Um, let me see if there's any other teaser. Um, I guess I'll end on some of these images of you know, this is what it actually looks like for community navigators to, um, to you know, really hold people's hands, quite literally, hold their babies, feed their babies, um, as they, you know, try to apply for rental aid. And um, if any of you have tried, you know, I'll just, we can tell you about all the unexpected technical glitches. Um, so I will stop there. And since we have a few more minutes for Q&A, thank you, thanks everybody. Uh, thanks, Jen, and, and thanks, Phil, for for your presentations. I know we are right at about three, but we can take a couple quick questions if there if anyone has the question they'd like to ask or a comment they want um, to throw out there. You can just feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question if you have one, or you can throw something into the chat. So hearing nothing and seeing that we are at three, I will just say again, uh, thank you to everyone for attending. Again, thanks to Jen and Phil for their great presentations. Um, we will be making this available um, on the USSEE uh, YouTube channel. So and you should, if you registered for the for Eventbrite, you should get a notification um, once, once, we, once we've done that. Uh, I also want to take a quick minute for those of you who for whom this is your first interaction with USSEE, I would like to strongly encourage you to check out our website, which I can throw into the chat here very quickly, um, and to consider uh, joining our organization. We, um, we, uh, this is the third event that we've done this year, but we also have a number of, we've also done a number of other webinars and are a group of economists and other academics um, across multiple disciplines, both in the social and natural sciences, who are committed to thinking about economics from a transdisciplinary and perspective and uh, wanting to bring ecology into economics where it has not traditionally been. And so I'm gonna throw this link into the chat very quickly. I encourage you to check it out if you have the chance. And again, thank you all for attending today. Thank you. Thanks for hosting, Phil. Thanks, Jen. Nice to meet you all. Thank you, it's great to be here. Thank you, great information.